Hi there, Lillian here. If you know someone that seems like their marriage is highly conflicted, you can feel that something's off, but you can't come right out and say it. If you have the kind of intimate relationship with her and if the opportunity provides a space for it, please forward any of my videos to her. Those of us stuck in this kind of Stockholm Syndrome are easily blinded by the attention from men. We cannot tell the difference between abuse and love. The reason I've started this channel is to wake up broken feminine hearts. I hope that by sharing my journey of how God transformed me from abused and broken into a healed and strong daughter of His might trigger common abuse for another victim that's trapped. Any knowledge that she might get from my story could be one of the steps that God uses on her healing journey. There's two possible outcomes with this knowledge. It can bring a wife into a more feminine embodiment that eases the negative tension in a difficult marriage, or it'll be her wake-up call that she's actually married to a wolf in sheep's clothing, and how healing will allow her to organically take back her personhood from the predator that lives in her house. So today I'm going to talk about not knowing the difference between conflict and abuse and how to start seeing it. I'm starting with a question and a picture. What does the environmental pulse of your marriage feel like? If it was possible to monitor the heartbeat of your marriage over a period of time, like an EKG, what would that reading look like? This is what I thought mine looked like even though I knew it didn't feel like that. In reality, my felt, mine felt more like this image. What does yours feel like? Are the purple rises of conflict getting less as the years increase in your marriage? Or is there less resolution and more conflict? And does it feel like repeated cycles, almost like an imprint inside of you that you recognize as it repeatedly emerges. I discovered it by charting the reality of what I had experienced. Drawing it out really helped me to grasp, get a grasp on the reality of what I had been living in. I had been pretending that my marriage was actually the purple one, but in reality, I think Maybe I knew deep down inside that it was the green one. I just didn't know how deep and dark it was. And, and even that, uh, maybe that's not the right way to say it. It doesn't capture. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know it was wrong. Those of you stuck in between the right and wrong of it, you know exactly what I mean. The EKG from a healthy, normal relationship has an entirely different reading. You can see way more of the level baseline. I've illustrated that with orange. The majority of the life of the marriage and conflicts from trials and tribulations that arise within this kind of marriage are experienced as walking in the spirit. That's a true one flesh relationship there's growth. With every year that passes, the man and the woman are creating a relationship paradigm that reflects Christ and the church more and more as each of them grow in the spirit. When you're married to a dangerous man, the baseline of normal living is strategic and short-lived. The majority of your life is lived below that baseline. There's hatreds, strife, jealousy, envy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, oppositions, divisions, addictions, carousing, and anything similar to those things. There's so much love of self and love of money. There's a lot of boasting and pride, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful for anything they've received from their parents, they are unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, and without self-control. They're brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, 
conceited, lovers of pleasure for self rather than lovers of God for others. We can read the words about living in the flesh, but those words didn't really mean anything to me. They weren't me. I don't live in the flesh. I'm a sheep. I'm born again. So cognitively, I couldn't accept it, even though I was experiencing those behaviors directed at me. It's the picture of the graph that punched the reality of the feelings that I was experiencing. It was in the process of drawing it out that the differences showed me just how below average my unhealthy relationship was. And even the word relationship, it didn't fit for me because I'm a sheep and he's a wolf. A relationship is not possible. It's an oxymoron, not a relationship. That's why he never tried to make the marriage better. It was always me. That's why every time I tried something to bring us closer, it made it worse for me. You don't know it when you're living in the muck. You think it's a relationship that's just really tough and hurting and difficult, but it's not. It's a trauma bond. It seemed like you were in a relationship at the beginning during the love bombing season. In fact, it was perfect. He was perfect. You were perfect. There was zero conflict or disagreements. In fact, there was over the top agreement and almost floaty type feelings of love and relationship togetherness. You were swept off your feet and it felt amazing, like a fairy tale. But now you're experiencing something completely different. You don't even know how or when it started. You just know that now you wouldn't describe your marriage as feeling amazing. It's painful and highly conflicted. Sister, that's not normal. Normal Christian relationships are positive. Not perfect, but mostly positive. They hover around the middle with varying degrees of difficulty and dysfunction, illustrated by the softer rises and falls. But the interesting thing is that if you're both real sheep, there's an upward trajectory for each of you. True believers grow, right? Each of you are growing more fruit in the respected area, respective areas that you each need to. If you're truly saved, these changes in each of you are what makes it smoother and more fulfilling as the years go by. In 1 Corinthians 7.28, Paul describes difficulties and dysfunction as flipsis. It means difficulties, trials, trouble, tribulation. It's relational conflict in marriage. If you experience negative stress more than positive encouragement that comes from true reconciliation from your thalipsis, you're not in a healthy relation, the healthy relationship that you think you are. You get attention, but it's not the attention you think it is. You're the host being fed off through the conflict. You know the baseline of your EKG is not trending smoothly in change, growth and maturity getting stronger. It stays impacted with poisonous toxins because the environment that you live in is below the line of normal. You experience activity and movement within the relationship. You think it's conflict, but there's never real change on his part, only yours. You're spinning in the same spot, in the same cycle, over and over and over again. The sharp descending spikes shooting far below the baseline are what happens the harder you try to make your marriage better, which drive you into more conflict, making your cycle descend deeper into the territory of the covert narcissist. This is where the flesh lives. Idolatry, strife, jealousy, envy, 
outbursts of anger, selfishness, separation, division, and isolation, which drives you deeper into the toxic aggression of the hungry wolf. In this descending cycle, you experience his massive love of self and conceit, his boastful pride, lack of any gratitude or self-control, open slander of everyone else, even your children. You are demeaned, unloved, and treated with brutal recklessness. Every single one of your conflicts are irreconcilable. You're not a wife, not in the capacity that you think you are, not the way God designed you to operate as a female. You thought you were in a transformational relationship. You were tricked and trapped into thinking that you're part of a symbiotic relationship with mutual benefit, but you're not. You're in a transactional one. Now, all masculinity is transactional. That's the way testosterone operates. Men are doers. They do good, then feel good. But there's a night and day difference between difficult and dangerous. A healthy man, even though he might be a difficult guy, he wants to be in a transformational relationship with his wife. She's the help for that to happen. Femininity transforms the transaction of masculinity. She makes him more masculine something he cannot get from a relationship with another man. But the unhealthy man is threatened by your femininity. In his own eyes, he is perfect the way he is. He hates the feeling of your femininity. He feels the pressure of your presence. And that's what makes him dangerous. Your femin feminine power has got to be squelched and diminished. He wants you to operate in the relationship like you're a man. So he treats you like a man in order to reduce the effect of your feminine presence. He does it through negative conditioning whenever your emotions surface. You're not seen as an equal teammate, but someone weaker, lesser, to be in competition with to conquer. And he uses his authority and power to accomplish that through aggression. Men are competitive with each other. That's why, if he's a wolf, you feel conflict instead of collaboration. You feel hunted and diminished instead of pursued and built up. You thought you were collaborating for mutual benefit, but instead you've become the primary source of narcissistic supply, captured in a trauma bond. What you're actually living is parasitism. Parasitism is where only one organism benefits to the equal ratio that the other is harmed. You miss it because you think the conflicts have been resolved, but in reality, you've just been set up for more abuse. That's the purpose of the strategically placed high peaks of the love bombing. It wraps itself in perceived positive conflict resolution. In reality, you've been gaslit into feeling like it's resolved. Those high peaks, way, way above the norm, trick you. This is how your nervous system is designed to operate. We relax when we feel like the conflict is over. We feel like it goes back to normal because to round out the lie of the love bomb, there's a small itty bitty time of baseline normal right after it. And now you're on the hook for a ride through another cycle of abuse. You can't see the obvious that you need to see until you're out of it to see it. I'm gonna say that again. You can't see the obvious that you need to see until you're out of it to see it. That's why you can't see red flags. You're literally living in the red flag. Another way of saying it, 
I'm sure you've heard the saying, you cannot see the forest for the trees. Well, for us, it's more like you cannot see the forest because all you can see is the single tree you're on. It would be more helpful if we stopped looking for particular red flags. It causes us to turn, think in terms of singular flags. It's blinding. It's overfocus and to overthinking. And we end up focusing down on a singular thing, a singular behavior, a relational event, exchange, or happening. And it becomes bigger to the exclusion of all else, all else, like what a microscope does. You lose the big picture. There's no universal indicator or a single thing that defines a covert narcissist. There is no red flag, so stop looking for them. You are already too close into it. If you're married to a dangerous man, it will be impossible to see. You're like a ladybug sitting on a leaf. You can't see the plant attached that the leaf is attached to. All you can see is the leaf that you're sitting on. A single flag doesn't mean anything. We have to learn to see in a different way. Remember, this is not if you're married to a healthy but a difficult man. This method, the, this, this method of charting and logging what you experience, this strategy, it's unnecessary if you just experience conflict alone. Conflict and dysfunction, it, it just means disagreement. Perhaps even lots of conflict or lots of dysfunction just means super opposite people with strong core values or beliefs. In order for abuse to be mistaken for conflict, it has to be grouped, not singular. Conflict alone is not it. To detect deception or manipulation or lying or subterfuge, you must think in clusters of behaviors, not individual traits or occurrences or exchanges or events. And the only way to think in clusters is to step back. Clusters reveal the patterns. Like a constellation, clusters of stars, it's impossible to tell the difference between the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper by only seeing one or even two stars. When you zoom in on those one or two stars, you lose the constellation. So if you just look at conflict, the same effect occurs. There's no cluster. But if you add two other elements, say static and confusion to every conflict, then you've got a cluster and a constellation is starting to emerge. With every conflict, you feel something's off because you're confused. Something doesn't line up because they're static. But remember, you can't see it yet. That's why you end up saying, I don't know, it feels like something's off. It feels like I can't see. It feels like we're further apart. I just can't put my finger on it. If you experience those clusters, then you're a wife that needs to stop looking at your husband through a microscope. You need to pull back so you can see what you can see. You know what you're feeling. You're not crazy. This is why I tell you to journal, log, make charts, make voice recordings. You need to take all the information down so that you can sort it as data away from emotions. I know I always say to feel your feels and I'm not telling you to ignore them. In fact, I'm, I'm telling you the opposite. Your feelings are the triggers that give you the information to plot. It's the plotting that's done in the cognitive region, in your head, not your heart. Your heart is always the first step. Then you see the pattern emerge from the data. Why does it feel wrong to do this? I think it feels wrong when you view marriage from the horizontal. This means you omit the vertical relationship. The roles of a husband and wife are the least. Those are the horizontal ones. They're for functionability while you're here on earth. The brother and sister bond and the internal relationship 
eternal relationship in Christ are the parts that matter. Those are the parts that are alive. Men think in analytical terms. Their primary operating system naturally encompasses logic and strategy. It's built into their masculinity. That's why they are self-evaluating and self-correcting through what they experience in relationships. Femininity does not operate this way in relationships. We evaluate externally. So we need outside methods and structures to help us with this. And there's nothing wrong with that. We do outside ourselves what they do in private within themselves. And when you're married to a dangerous man, that enemy that's right inside your home, sleeping in the same bed with you, puts you at a psychological and an emotional disadvantage. It's necessary to take it outside the area where the abuse is happening, inside your head and heart, so that you can see it. This way, the enemy cannot use your own feelings and emotions against you. Satan knew I was a sheep, married to one of his own, a wolf. He was counting on me using my sharp conscience in conjunction with my unhealed, broken heart against myself. He wanted me at a disadvantage, and I was for too many years. So, in effect, what I was doing with graphing and charting my experiences and emotions was separating the event from the emotional charge that the covert narcissist had baited me into each time. You don't fight unconventional warfare with conventional methods. You fight shrewdness by meeting the enemy where they're at. Imagine my shock in discovering that I wasn't married to an Abraham, a single-minded, difficult, and fearful man, but actually married to a Nabal, a selfishly reckless, heartless, and dangerous man. Closing thoughts. First, shh, don't say a word about this to him. Discovering that your husband's dangerous is a scary place to end up. It's never where you thought you'd be, and it feels like an unreality. But your silence about your awareness of what he really is, that's your safety zone. And always remember, a clueless guy that causes dysfunction and seems difficult, he's not dangerous. But the malignant man is not clueless. He just pretends to be difficult and dysfunctional so that he can hide how dangerous he is.